Hello Lurkers! I'm Lauren Stone, the owner and founder of PopLurker.com and you're back for another segment of Pop Lurker Reviews and today we will be reviewing Song of the Crimson Flower by Julie Dow. Beautiful, beautiful cover. Before we get started, give this video a big like and subscribe to Pop Lurker on YouTube so you don't miss a single one of our updates. I know that I just geeked out over Julie Dow's Forest of a Thousand Lanterns and Kingdom of the Blazing Phoenix, but oh my goodness gracious, I bought the follow-up novel, Song of the Crimson Flower, and like, I just lost my mind. Warning, there may be spoilers in this video. Bing, bing, bing. I didn't realize this book was already out. I mixed it up with another author's book that was on pre-order, so my brain got all like confused and said that this one was the one on pre-order and totally forgot about the other book that I had, you know, put on pre-order. And then I was like, after I finished the other two Feng Lu books by Julie Dow, I was like, oh my God, I want more. Did a five second Amazon search and realized this one was published in 2019. So Forest 2017, Blazing Kingdom of Blazing Phoenix was 2018, and this beautiful little piece was 2019. In my review of the other two books, which is a duology, like directly connected, the saga continues and ends, um, this one still, again, takes place in the world of Fang Lu, but is not a, I was under the impression, was not a direct sequel. Trot, treat, tweet, prequel. It's pretty well connected. The protagonists, the two main protagonists, are named Lan and Bao. This part of Fang Lu is more Vietnamese inspired, which is really beautiful because Ms. Dao is a Vietnamese American writer. And so the first books, Forest of a Thousand Lanterns and Kingdom of the Blazing Phoenix, were very much um, based in kind of Chinese and Japanese. You had people over in this corner of Feng Lu, the world that this takes place in, semi-fantastical, okay, it's very fantastical, what am I talking about? This fantastical, reimagined version of Earth where it's Asia. And we, so we have, you know, people with Japanese names over here, Chinese names over here, we discussed Zhifeng, and now we have the Vietnamese corner over here. And I'm just the biggest believer of like, write what you know. So, you know, as a, an Asian American woman, Ms. Dao does of course have the benefit of having, I guess, and I don't wanna sound stupid, if there is a generalized Asian American experience, but then you have to really narrow it down and to talk about, you know, the specific culture that you're from, <laughs> because, foods, traditions, uh, mannerisms just aren't the same everywhere, like of any culture, we know that. I've talked about it before that I'm a dual American Israeli citizen and so outsider looking in would be like, oh, you know, you Israelis and Persians and Armenians are all the same, but like if you ask Israelis and Persians and Armenians, like no, we're not all the same. <laughs> we're just all loud. I digress. I did not expect this story to be so directly tied. Like we straight up have characters that are main characters from the last two books. Like we still have Wei, um, who was going by Ming in, you know, Kingdom because it was a reveal that it was Wei, who was Ji Feng's lover. If you know, if you don't know the story, you don't know the story. But we have Commander Wei. We have Ren, who's an, a warrior in the Crimson Army and has been. This takes place eight years after the end of um, Kingdom. And so we have Empress Jade of the Great Forest. She's married to Koichi, who's devastatingly handsome. And she's pregnant, like very pregnant with their first child. Like she doesn't make much of an appearance. She's mostly just disgust positively. There's one scene with her and Koichi before Lan and Bao are off on their adventure. So let's talk about Lan and Bao and their adventure. All right, so the gist of it is that a young noble woman named Lan, about 18 years old, has been betrothed to this young man named Tom um, for basically all her life. Tom has a more or less adopted brother, like you know, a um, um, orphaned young boy named Bao who was brought into th to that family, raised as a physician's apprentice. He is this tall, gangly, awkward, like emotional character, and I've never seen a protagonist like that. He's just like a sweet, 
kind, lonely young man. And so when his, I guess I'll call him adopted brother, Tom decides like, no, I'm not going to marry this young woman, Lan, who Bao has been in love with since they were kids because he, she was so kind to him. Um, it's basically, the story challenges, on level one, challenges these beliefs of, you know, raising people up to here and sort of imagining what they are versus who they actually are. So Bao, all his life, raised Lan up here and was like, you're this perfect person. And then she is embarrassed because Tom's family knows that he doesn't want to marry her. So they had Bao write letters to her and he was riding on a boat in the dark playing his flute for her. She thinks it's Tom. She's like, what a romantic, perfect man. So she's raising him up here. And then when it turns out that parts of this person are actually Bao, she's all confused, she's embarrassed. Bao confesses to her that, oh, just kidding, that hasn't been Tom all that time and I'm in love with you. And she's like, but our stations are different. You're an orphan peasant and I'm a noble woman. And so you really feel for her though in that outburst and she slaps him across the face. It's all drama. It reminds me of one of my favorite movies, which is Don't Tell Her It's Me, which we're gonna discuss in our upcoming best movies ever segment that will be on Pop Lurker in the upcoming weeks. So keep an eye out for that one. Don't tell her it's me. Basically, a guy is in love with you, you reject him, and he's like, well, now I have to dress up as someone else and do all these things to make you love me. So Don't Tell Her It's Me was renamed as the boyfriend school, I think for legal purposes, but that's not, that's not the conversation we're having. So I'm just saying it was a familiar trope. In his devastation and embarrassment, Bao was like, I'm getting out of here. I'm not hanging out in this town like I'm humiliated. But you, again, you really feel for Lan. She's not just like this rich chick who's like, you're a peasant and I'm noble and F you, I'm rich. Like, you really feel her embarrassment. And even though you like Bao, you don't really know him yet. And the, and Ms. Julie Dow just does such a good job of making these both characters sympathetic. And then Lan realizes that like, I, she's never seen a man cry and she like, slaps Bao across the face and she's yelling at him. And like, he's this tall, you know, teenage young man and he's crying because like, he has no parents, he has no family, he has nothing, and all he's had is this fantasy of Lan. For better or for worse, no one told him to have this fantasy. And like, he's just smashed. So you, the reader, just feel really sorry for him, but you also really feel her embarrassment. You really feel how she was deceived. Um, you know, whether, whatever the intentions were, just really fantastic writing that sucks you in and makes you feel for the characters. Now on to the plot, to the adventure, to the fairy tale. So Bao bounces out, he gets out of here, and he's like, now, uh, he's so embarrassed, he's like, I'm gonna go to the evil witch, basically. He's going, he's going to go to the witch in the forest. Bao decides he's gonna go see the river witch, you know, and so that she can give him like a potion or something to make him forget everything that happens. We have a little bit of sunshine, spotted mine happening here, eternal sunshine and spotless mine. There we go. So we have a little bit of that happening here. He wants to forget, you know, Arrow, Arrow wants the potion that'll make her, you know, feel, feel better. So we have the river witch thing. And meanwhile, on the back burner of the story, um, we have a, an infectious disease called blood pox that's starting to infect certain areas. And so that's just, you know, remember that because it'll come back later. So he's rowing on his boat, finds the river witch, and just to be... Just, just to be a bitch about it, she curses him and basically stuffs his soul into his flute and was like, if an act of, basically you need to find an act of true love, someone needs to love you or your soul's gonna get sucked into this flute and you'll be a curse to be a flute forever. It's the flute that he, you know, played for Lon. It's a big deal. Um, love of music, the arts, you know, it's, it's a soulful thing. Beautiful imagery. So then long and short after he's cursed he sort of floats back doesn't know how he got back into town um and it turns out that the only person that can make his body like tangible and uh, opaque is lan so being near her keeps him present here on earth because otherwise he sort of starts fading away so now if they if so basically at first it's like if you the flute isn't close enough to you, you can't breathe and you start disappearing. But now if Lan isn't close enough to you, you can't breathe and you start disappearing. 
So he thinks that this act of love is finding his birth mother, whose name is Mistress V, and she is the not queen, but noble ruler of this town over here. And she's been cultivating black spice, which is very clearly opium. And she's been making this drug. Uh, and she thinks that she's going to cure this blood pox, but black spice is causing the blood pox. And so it's just this really layered story. And then it turns out the river witch is Mistress V's sister, who is then Bao's aunt. And so she's an anti-hero and we, you know, at first we're like that evil, you know, wench, but she's a victim of circumstance too, where her older sister, Bao's mom had stolen her man. And so Bao's this union between a betrayal. And so it's just this beautiful story. And then meanwhile, we're really cheering for the love of Lan and Bao because, you know, we, we know that she's the one to break the spell. But of course, you know, we have to, we have to get there. Bao thinks his mom will break the spell because she loves him. But like, we know from the start, I mean, that it's going to be Lan. Like she's, she's the one that keeps him grounded on earth, but it's really cute to see their love story. And it's one of those books where it's not a very long read. It's pretty short. It's pretty quick. I read it in like a day just couldn't put it down and it was like this lovely stormy day outside so I sat by my window with my cup of tea and just read this perfect book perfect short sweet YA book and it was like the potato chips I needed like it was just such a satisfying beautiful slice of strawberry cream cake it wasn't complicated. It was rich in details with characters that I knew. It was like watching the OAV spin-off of a wonderful anime or movie. And that really worked for me. So I give this book five out of five lurks. Loved every second of it. And I've been giving a lot of the books I'm reading, you know, like three and a half. That's just the reality of it. Um, so to yay, be able to give one a good old five out of five makes me feel good in the chestular cavity where my heart resides. So that's all I got for you guys today. I'm Lauren Stone with poplurker.com. Stick with our site for all sorts of evergreen content. Love what you love and never stop lurking. I'll see you for the next one. Bye.